We spend almost 88% of our work week communicating and 19 hours alone on written tasks. And here's the number one assumption that we make. The communication comes naturally. And of course it doesn't. Whether it's our personal or professional life, communication can really open the doors to new opportunities and really either help strengthen or sometimes destroy relationships. This comes from a new report done by Grammarly, which is absolutely fantastic. And to discuss this even more and what we need to be thinking about when it comes to the future of communication in the AI world, I am so delighted to be joined by Matt Russell. He is the senior director in the Mayo Clinic communications department, and he co-led the department's efforts to establish guidelines, use cases, and create training processes for ChatGPT and other generative AI tools. Matt also leads the department's generative AI super user group, which we're going to talk much more about, and it's a really a group that's focused on continuous exploration and innovation. He's formerly an award-winning senior reporter for the Rochester Post Bulletin, and Matt joined the Mayo Clinic in 2012. He served as the communications lead for their $3.76 billion campaign for Mayo Clinic and led Mayo Clinic's engagement with PBS for the premiere tour supporting the Ken Burns documentary, The Mayo Clinic. I always love starting any interview by asking people, what was that moment when you knew this technology was gonna be totally different from anything else we've seen? How do you navigate change? It's a question we think about often and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin and how do you develop the mindset and skills to be successful? You're listening to Designing Schools, and I'm your host, Dr. Saba Kidwai, educator, researcher, and storyteller. Join me each week for stories and strategies that bridge the gap between research and practice as together we explore how might we design schools. Yeah, so I'd, I'd been interested in AI for a number of years and was kind of waiting to see what is that thing that's going to come along that's going to really be useful in communications. And so when I saw when I heard about ChatGPT, I was like, all right, that's it. But I didn't try it right away. And so I went out and had coffee with a couple of friends from work who are not in the communications department. And they both the, in the first two weeks had completely started using it. And our entire conversation was about chat GPT and they're like talking about all the different ways that they're using it. And just the excitement, I was like, Oh my gosh, I, I need, I need to get on this now, you know, and, and part of the discussion too, where it was some kind of half joking, like, Oh, I suppose you don't need to write anything anymore. You know? And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I could see how people could have that question. So we need to learn about this and see what it does well, what it doesn't do well and, and how to use it and, and get on top of it soon. Cause it's, this is a major disruption. And so what was kind of that first experience and what did you use it for? What did you try it for? Were you impressed by it in the beginning? Like what was your first take? Yeah. So the first uses that I had of it were to help me with wordsmithing. And it, it's still one of my most common use, use cases where I'll, I'll be in the middle of doing a lot of different things and I'll be stuck on writing a sentence for something and just trying to get it right. And you can just go into ChatGPT and ask it for some options and it'll give you some language that can help. And that, that to me was sort of mind blowing because it was taking from, it was basically a thesaurus for sentences or a thesaurus for paragraphs. And I still say if, if that's all that it could do, I, I would think it, would just, it was an amazing invention because it's, it's so helpful. How do your colleagues in the wider community feel about it? Do you have like conversations with them or I'm sure you're more connected with those circles, but what, what is the general feeling that you gather as you read and listen to people? I think there's a range. I think anytime there's a new technology, you have that bell curve where you have the early adopters and people who are more prone to adopt a little later on. And so, you know, I think starting within our communications department, we adopted it fairly early. We started in about discussions around April or May, like formally adopting uh, ChatGPT before there was an or a real organizational policy at Mayo Clinic and before a lot of other people did. And so, you know, those discussions are really helpful because it were, people were asking the, the really good questions about um, wh what about plagiarism and what about bias and what about hallucinations and all of these things. Uh, and so I think those concerns are still there for some people, but I see, I see a lot of excitement in our department. So 
with the one of the measures I have is we have a super users group that we meet every every three weeks. It's for 30 minutes. It's a really low time commitment, but I think a lot of value you get. We started with seven people and we have over 30 now. And so we're getting up to about you know 20, 25% of the department that are super users of, of Chat GPT. And um and, and I know there's a lot of use um you know, otherwise, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's still some people, you know, at, at Mayo and elsewhere who are still kind of warming up to it. And, and some of it depends on the type of work you do. You know, some people work with, with clients who may not be as open to it or, or in areas where the things are a little more sensitive. So that, that has a, an effect on it as well. I want to pause and recap what Matt just shared. They didn't wait for someone else to tell them what they could do. They came together, they talked about concerns, they talked about how they were using these tools, and they formed this group that would then share their findings to go on to inform both guidance and policy. Now, Grammarly's report that I talked about earlier on communication, generative AI, and business results also shared that 73% of professionals say that Gen AI makes them better at communication, but the challenge is that most companies don't have guidelines or are just not even talking about it. And 58% of people actually wish that their company was more open to having a conversation about generative AI so that people could be sharing their use cases, but also be implementing safe and ethical practices. Now we can help address this in two ways. First, if you are that leader, you should probably know that most of your employees are probably already using these tools. So creating a plan for safe and ethical use use that will ultimately protect you and your company is probably the best way to go. But if you are somebody who maybe doesn't have that decision-making power, but you're on the other side and you've been using it, here's what you need to do. Now, you can either do this yourself or you can get together with a few other people, either on your team or even across different teams. And number one, you're gonna choose an example. This information should sort of all be able to fit on one slide. You're gonna share the task, the time that it took previously, how much time it saved you, and any other benefits related to your work. Now, these don't just have to be productivity benefits, they can also be mental health benefits as well. Like, I was so much less stressed about this certain thing. And and because of that, you were able to either maybe start working on something else or it freed your time to do something else. Being able to really share those outcomes in very specific ways is a fantastic way for people to be able to see beyond just, oh, that chat GPT, that AI tool that everyone's talking about to, oh, this is the impact it can have in, in our organization and most importantly, on our people. So instead of being that person who says, oh, our company's so lame, they're not even talking about Gen AI, be that leader, because in today's world, as I often share, leaders are not defined by their titles. They're defined by their ideas and their impact. I have a one pager you can download in the show notes to actually help you put this together. And if this idea intrigues you, let's continue learning from Matt about what it looks like to put together a super user group just like this. Okay, so I love this idea of super users and you know that, that's something that we recommend actually to a lot of people. I think anytime you get people together to be able to share people learning from people, just mostly also because the technology moves so fast, you can't wait for somebody else to keep teaching you. What advice do you have or how do you, like first let us know maybe how you spend that time. And then I'd love to hear advice you have for people who are like, oh, I wonder if there's anyone in my department that would want to be a super user with me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this group. It, it's a really engaged group and kind of a self-selecting group. And we, we really try to mix it up. I, 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 my number one goal is to not make it boring. And so I try to have every meeting be a little different. But it very, but often it includes people sharing how they use ChatGPT in their different areas because you know that's so helpful for people just to see those practical use cases. Um, we we did a hands-on exercise one day where we had different scenarios and we had people work through it and and see what they they came up with. Um, just th just this week we met we we had an in-depth discussion on on prompting, um, and you, you know I I shared um, I do demos of different tools and things like that. But we, we try to keep it fun um, and like I'll send things to the group every once in a while. That's the, the great thing is between meetings, we're still connecting and sharing articles and things like that. And I so I made like an avatar of myself once, you know, and, and was kind of like, hey, this isn't me. What do you think about this? And um, and then for the holidays, there's a, another tool called like Suno AI. And I made like a, like a song, like a few songs for them, like a hair metal song and like country and, and and like you know for for like that group so we just try to just have a lot of variety in what we do and, and have fun can we just hit pause real quick did you hear his last two words 
have fun. Somewhere along the way, we have made work so miserable for anyone. And if you have not yet read Seth Godin's The Song of Significance, let Matt's call for us to have fun be your signal to pick this up. I'm actually going to read you an excerpt from this opening page where basically he says that we have lived with the grind for so long that it's easy to imagine that we are stuck with it. But better, he says, is within our reach. This is a book I highly recommend because having fun is within our reach. And I mean, we spend a third of our day at work or at school when we're younger. So isn't it about time that we make this the best hours of our life instead of the worst? In this book, Seth Godin goes on to talk about how he interviewed 10,000 people across 90 countries. And he asked them, what would today be like if you had the best job ever? And here's what people shared. I surprised myself with what I could accomplish. I could work independently, the team built something important, and people treated me with respect. So again, here it is, the song of significance. Now, generative AI presents us with an opportunity to do work that actually encompasses all four of those elements. But as Seth Godin says, if we want this, we have to make that choice to lead. And I really hope you're noticing the theme here because I meet way too many of you who have really forgotten the agency and the power it is that you have. And you're always waiting for somebody else to come and tell you what to do. And it's not really the trying that scares us. It's the how. Like, what should I actually do? What is that first step, second step, third step that I need to take if I do want to act on these ideas that I have? And so I actually created a resource to help with this. It's a completely free quiz that will actually help you self-identify where you are in your AI journey. So for example, if you're an explorer, you're somebody who's just getting started and maybe just getting familiar. If you are a navigator, you're somebody who's thinking through the challenges and opportunities. Or if you've like been playing around with this and you're a strategist, maybe you want to scale Gen AI across your organization. But no matter where you are in your AI journey, the results from the quiz are going to give you a roadmap for you to take your next three steps to actually accelerate and move your work forward. It's completely free and it is available to you in the show notes. Now let's go back to Matt and to find out what does communication even mean? Because so often we use words and assume that we're all talking about the same thing, whether it's communication, critical thinking, creativity, but these are actually very complex words that are made even more complex now that we have tools like AI that can also do many of these things. So I ask Matt, how do you define communication and what should we be teaching young people about this skill? Yeah, I mean, communication is is making a, a connection with other people and, and conveying ideas and getting them to act a certain way, think a certain way, feel a certain way. And the the, the method that you use for that can vary. It could be the written word, it could be video, it could be whatever. And I think that's one really exciting thing with AI is that it's, it's opening up all these avenues Especially, I think, as you look into the next year with video, uh, the the what you can create is just been completely blown open, you know. So, um, but you know, one thing that's interesting, I um, I spoke to a group of English majors a, a few years ago, and I was talking about like the value of an English major and saying, you know, it's really helpful to be able to take you know massive amounts of information and, and synthesize it. And you know, and and sort of bring it forward in a digestible way, you know. And and but now now we have generative AI that can do that. But but I think what one of the skills that people that is going to be really important is that human judgment and discernment of like this is good, this isn't. And and so as we start using these these tools more, they can churn a lot of things out. But it still takes someone to know this is what we should go with and and have that be a good decision. Right. It's, you know, one of the things that somebody really made me kind of like, I just didn't really have an answer for is somebody said, well, you're able to make those kinds of decisions and do those kinds of things because you didn't have these technologies growing up. And, you know, you were able to develop that critical thinking. Do you think it's still like, what would you say to somebody like that? Like for people who believe that you just can't develop that critical thinking anymore because these AI tools are here to interfere in the process. I think it cuts both ways. I think I think it's an amazing tool to help you with critical thinking and that that has this power to bring multiple perspectives to anything that you're working on. And so if you have that mindset to to seek that out, it it can help you a lot. I, I have no doubt that it, it, a lot of people will use it as a crutch. And that is something that's going to happen that I would argue maybe those folks would maybe use something else for a crutch anyway. 
Um, but th something that I've been thinking about lately is um, I saw a quote about how there's like a thousand thoughts in your head that you don't, that you're not aware of until you sit down to write. And there's something in that process of writing that brings ideas forward. And, um, and so I think what the incredible thing is about generative AI is that it is now a choice whether we muddle through something or not. And, you, you know, sometimes like the, the example that I gave when I'm in the middle of a million different things and I just have this one sentence, there's not a lot of value in muddling through that because I have other things to do. But, but if you're, but if you're writing something, it, there still is value in that. And, and so I think that that is something that will probably decrease. And so I think there's going to be a lot of value in people who know when to muddle and when not to muddle and find that, that right balance with, with AI. It's no secret that I am not a fan of most AI education apps, those lesson plan generators that promise to save you time and help the burnt out teacher. And let's be clear, the teaching profession is a disaster. Nowhere in the world of work, perhaps, are things more broken than they are within the teaching profession. But having graduated as a first year teacher during what I would consider to be our last inflection point, 2007, the same year the iPhone came out and we had this like new world of mobility, I can tell you that easy decisions lead to a hard life later. And it's fascinating sort of being a CEO and having a company now where I work with schools and businesses to integrate technology, to think differently about how we work and learn, given that when I graduated during the last inflection point, I was completely the opposite. I had no clue what I was doing. And so it's very clear to me now why I graduated so unprepared. And it's because with these cheap and easy solutions that people are constantly sending the way of the teacher, they don't have that opportunity to engage in that messy middle and muddle through situations the way Matt is describing. And we've really done this for so many years where to now it's compounded to where not only is the profession a disaster, but the strategies aren't even preparing us. And while many of these tools might feel good in the moment, they really have severe long-term consequences for you as an individual because you in your profession now are not really developing the skills or the mindsets that you need to really grasp what these technologies are, how they can be used, but more importantly, the opportunities they create and the skills we need to be preparing young people for, but really ourselves as well. And while that might sound very dramatic, look around. The profession is a disaster and it really has been for quite some time. However, I really believe that we educators can use this moment to lead, as Seth Godin says, to make teaching the best job ever. And it really begins with taking that first step, what Matt calls choosing to muddle. And it's why I'm a really big advocate for people learning how to prompt because when prompting, you are writing, you are muddling, and you are thinking, what do I really want? What do I want to create? How do I overcome the barriers that are in my way? And how do I even name those barriers that I can't solve for? But hey, Chad GPT, you're really good at figuring things out, so how can you help me? Now, this process of muddling is ultimately what helps you create new best practices that will ultimately inform your guidelines. So I asked Matt to share the example of how he came to see the roles we have in communication when we collaborate alongside these generative AI tools. I think this is how I found you, or this is one of the posts that like, I was like, wow, I need this person on my podcast, was I really, really loved how you broke down the roles of the different um, individuals in like the process. Do you know what I mean? The expert, intern, yeah. Yeah. artist. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell us a little, tell me how you came to that. Like, I want to hear the full story of like the evolution of your thinking and being able to come to that conclusion because- Honestly, I didn't even make the English connection until I just started talking to you right now. But now when I think of those two things together, like what a beautiful way to be able to help young people make some of those decisions that you're talking about or just build that self-awareness. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks uh, for asking that. Um, so it started pretty pretty early after using ChatGPT for a couple of months, having the idea of it being like an intern. And, and, and as I found out that probably what, that wasn't a very unique idea because I started seeing a lot of other people say that as well, but I thought the intern made a lot of sense because you have to give it exact instructions for what to do and you need to uh, have responsibility for, for its work and, and all of these other things, but it's willing to do anything. It's like the, the most amazing, but yet most unreliable at times intern that you can, that you can think of. And so 
that was the idea that I had for a while. But then over the course of the years, I started using it more. And I think particularly as the image image generation tools became really good, like Dolly 3, I was using a lot and um, and creating a lot of, of images and, and for presentations and things like that, getting that exact image that, that you want to, to match the point that you want to make. And so I kind of had the idea of, you know, in the back of my mind of the artist. And then when when Jim and I came out from Bard, um, I was really interested, and I'd, I'd been hearing from some of my colleagues and 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 other sources that Bard had gotten really good at writing, um, just like draft text. And so I did a little experiment where I actually I went to ChatGPT and I'm like, what would be an experiment I could run to, to test to test you know the writing styles? And it gave me like, well, have it do a science fiction story and a poem and this and that and the other thing. And so I matched them up, and Bard like was a lot better than than ChatGPT in in that um, in that instance. And so I wrote a post kind of saying, you know, I think Bard is kind of like the artist. And um, and ChatGPT is like your workhorse. It's going to just get things done and, and really crank things out. And so the last step in it was at the end of the year, um, I was just kind of reflecting on you know all of the uses and things like that. And so this was kind of an example of kind of the good old fashioned sort of muddling where I I went through and this is crazy, but I went through all of my um, my my chats and ChatGPT and there were like hundreds of them and just and I was kind of like how have I actually been using it over the course of this of this year you know and so I kind of came up with like a top you know list or whatever and um and I wanted to post something on LinkedIn and you know it's kind of like okay the interns all along with the artists but there's also this more strategic element that's super exciting where you can get those different perspectives you can have it run a game theory analysis of different situations. You can have it do amazing things. And that's that's the advisor. And so as I looked at my use cases, I'm like, yep, yep, yep. That kind of captures it all. So that was that was kind of the evolution of that. Oh my God. I really, really, really like that. I also really like like you, everything you just described was literally an example of that entire muddling phase. Like, and that's mm -hmm. why I, I, I really, I, I personally really believe that it has enhanced my critical thinking. Like it's making me do things that I would have otherwise thought maybe weren't possible or just were too hard or I didn't have time for. And once you sort of engage in that and you get over that initial step one, it just opens the door to like a world that oftentimes you don't even know is out there but I feel like you know and when I talk to people like you I'm always like these people are so like they're just so humble because they don't realize like they say these things so effortlessly without realizing like clearly there is some major mindset work going on confidence work going on leadership work curiosity work like there's so many subtle factors that allow you to even just do that experimentation process of like yeah let me go back and see how I've been using it what I've been doing and so, you know, I always share with like, you know, that I feel like AI is like, or any technologies often are culture shifts in how we work, how we learn. I, I used to work at Apple and I really, with AI, I feel like a lot of people that understood mobility and appreciated even just the freedom of being able to do something like this. You just have a different appreciation for AI because you know that it can just raise the bar. And so I'm curious when you think about, you know, whether it's your colleagues or whether it's, you know, just young people, what are some of those mindsets that you think are going to be really important? Because a conversation that often happens in education is like this bridge to the workforce is like, how are you preparing kids for future jobs? And, you know, let's talk to people in industry and see what they're doing and what they're, you know, what's working, what's not working. So what are some of the mindsets or other things that you think are important for young people to really be focusing on or schools to be focusing on? I think I think definitely continuous learning and and paying attention to everything that's happening now. You you really need to keep up with it. But I think most important is a, is a mindset of experimentation, and I think that's been the biggest thing for me over this year. Is just everything is like this is this is just an experiment, and it is it, it kind of lowers the stakes a little bit even when you're trying new things. It's like okay, I'm just trying this out, you know, and. And that for me has been everything from trying different things with ChatGPT or trying different tools or posting things on LinkedIn. It's just like, okay, this is an experiment. I'm just going to try this and see what happens. And so I think you need to have that willingness to, to learn and try new things and be consistent with it. Uh, I think I think consistency is is really important right now. This is this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. There's there's times where it feels a little bit like a sprint. It definitely is, but it's a marathon, and you, you just gotta be 
consistent with what you do and, and keep plugging away at it. Continuous learning and a mindset of experimentation. These are the exact skills and mindsets that come when you practice and apply design thinking. Now, if you want to learn more about how you can design thinking to start a small experiment, I actually have a free webinar where I walk you through the entire process of doing a design thinking experience alongside chat GPT. And of course it will be linked for you in the show notes. Now I really want to emphasize why this matters. I meet so many people who are waiting for someone else to give them guidelines, for someone else to tell them what they can and cannot do. And at a time where we're all really worried about our jobs and careers and what AI means for us, now is not the time to be a follower. Now is the time to be a leader. And you lead by example, by creating examples. You need to try small experiments to actually create good guidelines because here's the problem. We don't actually know the nuances of a lot of what guidelines even need to be until we've actually tried a few experiments in a really safe way. That's when we go away from simply saying AI is like an intern to here are the three stages of how you can work together when working on a writing assignment the way Matt shared with us. Now, it's also how we go away from telling people you can use AI here, but you can't use it there because as any AI user knows, the best use cases actually have AI integrated so flawlessly that they are embedded into so many of our tools that instead of telling me where you did and didn't use it, we should actually very organically be able to assess the process as a whole instead of just that one end product. And that's a really big change for assessment. And use cases can be really hard sometimes because like guidelines, we want to know what they are or what should we should be doing. And the answers, like I said, can only really come when we begin to experiment. So I asked Matt to share how him and his team went about creating and evaluating use cases. So I was surprised to learn just how much of this experimentation Matt had actually been doing with just the free version of ChatGPT. Um Okay, so I told you about the the kind of the the smackdown that I had between Bard, and so um, Bard won in terms of writing. In terms of if you're asking it to produce, uh, just draft, just write me a story about something. I think Bard is really good at that. It's also good at things. I, I had I compared Bard to GPT four in in terms of writing like a business plan, and Bard's was actually better there too. It had more of a narrative to it. But GPT-4 is is by far superior overall, and and you know has the the the, the greatest capabilities. It, it it does the role playing. Bard didn't wouldn't even engage in the role playing, then, which is a huge aspect of it. But I think my take on it is that there's no single product out there that is the best across the board, um, because even Claude is is good at at generating writing and working on things. I, I use that. Sometimes I'll hop between. If I'm if I'm working on a piece of writing, I'll put it into like each one of them because I feel like sometimes ChatGPT has a bad day or something like that or needs a little more, you know, TLC to get it to where you want it to be. Whereas like right out of the box, Bard and Claude give you um, pretty solid results and perplexity, by the way, actually as well. If that's one that people hasn't haven't used is is excellent and it, the, what makes it so great is it gives you an annotation for every line that it provides so you can see where it gets its information and this is why you're a super user <laughs> <Hopping> between <laughs> all the different ones <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what do you see for the future of i guess just like i guess what do you see what what do you see as being the most exciting thing coming next and what do you see as something that worries you coming next yeah the most exciting would be how much more powerful these models are going to get we're going to see a more powerful version of chat gpt this year we're going to see a more powerful version of bard that seems pretty certain and then everything the multimodal that i mentioned before how much better text to video is getting and text to music like i mentioned earlier and and the imagery um, that all, I think when you look at how that's advanced, even over the last six months, it's insane. And so you think about over next year, it's really going to be something in terms of um, what, you know, it concerns me a little bit more. Um, I guess, you know, some things I'm watching, they'll be interesting, like the end of the New York Times um, lawsuit against OpenAI to see where that lands, because that's that really hits at the core of how these models are built. And 
I, so I don't know if that's going to have any impact. I, I think probably not. Um, but you know, I, I think it's just the the way it will be used in the year that we're entering is is a concern. And I, I think of how easy it was for me to create an avatar of myself in, in ten minutes. And there's amazing technology out there, and I know a lot of people are concerned about that with with everything that's happening this year. Yeah, no, definitely. You are such an incredible, I just love your way of thinking. Um, tell us like how you learn, where you learn, what some of your like, I guess like, yeah, what is the way that you stay up to date with these different trends and things for people with, so people can kind of learn a little bit from you? Yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, like the AI breakdown um, podcast is to me is a, is a real must listen. And um, so that's that's one that I that I really highly recommend, and and others, um, you know, touch on it here and there, and then just kind of reading everything that I can on it. And um, you know, it's 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 just a weird thing where this is something I had an interest in before. I, I I've worked on some I hadn't worked on, but Mayo's had different AI committees, and in my role in communications, I've kind of been a fly on the wall for discussions for years. So I've kind of like seen what's happening behind the scenes and. And now that it's like, oh, wow, this is the thing in um, communications, it sort of lit a fire under me, I guess, to be like, yeah, this is like the disruption of like what I do for my living, what my, you know, my friends do. And, um, and so it, it's really, um, but also it's just interesting and fun and exciting. So, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's just kind of inhaling everything that I can about it. And, um, and just, and just, again, having that, that regular use. You, you know, just being consistent with it over time. And, and, and I think that that's, it is just paying attention to what's happening. As soon as new things come out, I test them. Um, you know, like the GPT uh, store that came out this week, I, you know, I went in and was going through that and kind of, you know, so I, I try to just stay on top of like, if something new comes out, I'm checking it out and seeing if it's, if it's worth um, doing more with. I really like that. When you are looking through those things, do you have a certain criteria or filter or something that you're kind of looking through them through so that you don't feel like, oh my God, it's overwhelming. There's something new every single second. Yeah. Just looking at the quality of the, of the outputs, I think, and, and how easy it is to use, you know, with, with the, with the GPT store, for example, I think that there's some things that add some new capabilities perhaps but there's a lot of things where it's like, if you know a, a, a prompt, you, you don't need the GPT, um, it, you know? So it's sort of like, I, I, the thing that I was thinking of is there's, I don't know, on the Food Network, there's uh, the celebrity chef, Alton Brown, or you know, yeah. he talked about like the unitaskers in the kitchen and all these, you know, and I was thinking of like, and we have one in our kitchen. I was looking, it was like the, the avocado peeler that has like, you know, all the, and it's like, you could really just do that with a knife, you know? So I think a lot of the GPTs are like unitaskers. So it's like, I think it's sort of like, how do you prioritize the tools that are going to be the most helpful? And, that, and that's where I'm with you on GPT-4. It's That's the go-to. And then it's it's what I've been hearing and reading is it's amazing how persistent it's been for nothing to top that. And people are wondering when that'll happen. We live in a world where we can connect and learn with anyone, anywhere. And this is something that truly for me will never get old, even though I've been doing this now for like the past 15 years. And so I'm just so grateful to Matt for joining us here today. And of course, I will be sharing all of his contact information with you in the show notes so that you can connect and join the conversation as together we learn the skills and the mindsets that hopefully are going to give us a human advantage in an AI world and make us irreplaceable with not just AI, but other emerging technologies as well. So if you want to keep the learning going, start by taking our quiz, getting the exact steps that are simple, actionable, and specific to helping you take that next step on your AI journey. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you have. In a world where time and attention are so valuable, thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Designing Schools community. Leaving a review for the podcast helps others learn about the show, giving them the gift of knowledge and allowing this community to help create access and exposure to ideas and opportunities others may not even know exist.